Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the number one international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, we have Gigi Trebatusky. From calling for her dad to chase people out of her room at night, to a mystical experience during First Communion, and an intense clairsentient experience at a Civil War battlefield when she was just 11 years old, Gigi has had a fascination with spiritual and metaphysical subjects. She has lived deeply connected to her intuition most of her life and drawn people to her, seeking guidance for as long as she can remember. Over the past decade, and with the help of her dog Scrappy, Gigi has been on a journey of self-healing and reawakening. As part of this journey, she has studied evidential mediumship and spiritual healing at the Arthur Finley College in the UK. Her studies have also included shamanism, dream work, past life regression, energy work, and most recently, spirit art and animal communication. There's a lot more to say about Gigi, but I'd rather her tell you in her own words. Her website is indigosoulways.com, or you can simply go to we don't die radio.com, click on episode 122 to find out much, much more. Gigi Trebatusky, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Gigi. I have a big so smile on my face. Here. I know. <laughs> you and I have been corresponding for months, and we have yes. the same tutor in Minister Matthew Smith. So he introduced us, and I'm really grateful. Such a blessing. <laughs> yeah, my new fan, my new friend. Where are you this morning? You're in Florida, correct? Yes, for uh, Southwest Florida, Fort Myers area. How nice. And you're by Sitting the beach. looking at the beach at the moment. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. I'm in Massachusetts and it's a nice fall day. The leaves are changing uh-huh. outside. We're recording this in October 2016. I always think, Gigi, that sometimes somebody listens to this 10 years in the future. And so they're going to picture what it is that we're experiencing. Anyways, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? You, uh, The introduction you sent me about the things that happened in in childhood and chasing people out of your room. Could you just talk a little bit about your background and and some of these things? Sure. Um, So I, as far as, as far back as I can remember, I um, have been sort of fascinated with life and birth and death. Um, You know, I, I'm going to give my age away here, but my okay. earliest memory is when I was two years old coming down from a nap in a two-story uh, townhouse and seeing my mother and brother crying in front of the TV. And I think it was probably the first time I ever saw my mother crying and it just struck me. It stayed with me. It happened to be the day that John Kennedy was shot. And um, I, I've actually relived that dream over and over again in my lifetime. So I think it was a beginning of of awareness that I somehow began to question life, death, things. And it seems funny to be two and doing that, but that that was the case. Then my grandfather died when I was five years old, or four and a half going on five, something like that. And my mother um, and father chose to take my brother who was six and my, myself was five along to the to the visitation. And um, I got sent home eventually, but not because I was upset, but because what I was saying was probably upsetting other people because I got there and I was like, but mom, that's not grandpa. Why are people up at the, the, at the coffin? That's not grandpa. He's, he's not here anymore. <laughs> and so, um, and it really, you know, I just couldn't wow. understand why all of these people, uh, to me, there was this doll laying in the casket in the front of the room that just was not grandpa. And, um, and so my mom, my mom, uh, took me back to my aunt's house between visitation and the funeral. And, and at the time, she said she was worried that I was too young and I shouldn't have been there and that I was getting too upset. But I really, looking back, think it was way more about that I was in my, 
youth and and honesty, I was upsetting people in their own grief. And so, um, so it was interesting. It was the beginning of my thinking, you know, I had a two-year-old sister at the time that every time we'd go back to grandpa's house would ask, where's grandpa? And you're like, he's yeah. dead. He went to heaven. And then about, um, so, so again, you know, I started at a very young age exposed to death and, and, and talking a lot about it. And I was always very interested as well in, hmm, how can I say, spirituality. My, I grew up in a uh, Polish Catholic German Lutheran family. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I went to catechism classes on Saturdays, but I was really blessed with a family who emphasized the spirituality rather than the religion. And so um, as I got a little older, we went to a what I would call a radical Catholic church that really started to blend into other religions and other things, which really began to open me to, to thinking even more. But um, as we mentioned at the beginning, I... Uh, so I started, I started hearing my, I didn't remember the people being in my room when I died. I mean, died when I was <laughs> asleep at night. That's funny. Um, when I went to sleep at night, but I remember often my mother telling, like my grandparents would come over on the weekend and my mom would say, oh yeah, you know, Fred, had, my dad had to go in Gigi's room last night and chase all the people out again. And, and so now I'm looking back, I think about those stories and I think, well, that was probably signs to, to people if they were not, um, if they were not as close to, to mediumship as, as they were at the time, um, to say, hey, something's going on. It's not just, uh, you know, I was, uh, nobody wanted to sleep in my room because I used to say I had, later I said I had a ghost that would come at night. I would see this white face that would float in the room oh, by yeah. me. And um, by then I was scared because I'd been taught to be scared of these things. Absolutely. And yet, and yet I was still fascinated. And so, and I read a lot as a kid. Um, when I read John Holland, who's an interesting medium, when I read him, uh, his book called Born Knowing, he talks about how he spent all this time in his room reading while everybody else was out playing. And I thought, yeah, you know, in sixth grade, I was reading Jung's Dream Analysis. Oh, <laughs> and, my gosh. And, and Pascal's uh, Mathematic Proof of God Existing and some other bizarre things like That's that. So I wild. had this huge fascination. And I had prophetic dreams as a child. Um, not the kind of horrible ones where you're seeing somebody in a car accident necessarily, although I did have a repetitive dream where my brother was being killed in a car accident when he was young. And in his 30s, he actually had a car accident where a very similar circumstance, a truck car, which is what I had been dreaming, um, caused him to get a, a, a neck injury that caused his life essentially to come to a stop for five years as they were in lawsuits and trying to treat him medically and whatever. And I said, you know, really looking back at that dream that I'd been having over and over and over again since I was about 10 years old, where I dreamt that he had a truck car accident and his head was cut off. Um, it really was in a sense because he had this tremendous head injury. Um, he, you know, fortunately has completely recovered, but it it did end his life as he knew it at the time. And what was really interesting was he had blocked memories. And when he had that dream, I mean, when he had that accident years later, he actually remembered memories from that time period when I had been dreaming the dream. So it to me, it started to open more questions about, well, how can that be? And what does that mean about life and how it works and how we're interconnected oh yeah yeah what um, happened with first communion well first communion so back to that yes so first communion i went to a very conservative catholic church in the 1960s with an old 90 year old monsignor that would teach our first communion classes and i so back then and i don't know maybe today still people for first communion are told to um to fast for for like 24 hours or 12 hours in front of your first communion to open the space for for Jesus to come into hmm. and um my parents you know as i said they they were on the spirituality and not the religion and they're like jj you're 8 years old 
you've got to eat. You cannot not eat. And I'm like, no, no, no. I not have fast. to do this. Yes. Get fast. And I, I went in. I got to wear my mother's wedding veil. It was very special. Whatever. Back then, you would get very dressed up almost like a, a, mm-hmm. a bride to go to communion. And I was quite hungry. I insisted I wouldn't have breakfast that morning. And it was a morning communion. And as I took the Eucharist onto my tongue and swallowed it, or, you know, let it dissolve and then swallowed it and went back to the pray in the pew. I, my hunger was gone and I was full. And I said to my parents, I remember on my way home, I said, oh man, it was so cool. <laughs> Tell the story. Just like Monsignor said, when, when I took the Eucharist, I was filled with Jesus inside of me. Wow. And, and everyone laughed at me, you know, of course. they do. They laughed at me and, 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 um, said, oh yeah, uh huh, you know, sure, whatever. And let's go home and eat something. <laughs> Oh, I'm so, sure you were the wild child with all the people yeah. that were in your room and the ghost and here's this. Yeah, How about yes, the Civil the, War battlefield that you told yeah, me about? Yeah, so our first trip to Florida, where our family used to take car trips. So our first trip to Florida, 19, early 1970s, when a lot of people weren't doing it, and we stopped in Chickamauga Battlefield in, in uh, northern Georgia, um, which we later learned was... I think one of the last great victories of the South, an extremely bloody battle. And it was a kind of a foggy day, kind of dreary. We were getting a lot of dirty looks because I think it was a fairly new thing for a Wisconsin license plate to be driving through the Chickamauga battlefield. And um, as we stopped, as we were walking through, there were these placards all over that would tell us about the, the, the battles that had taken place there. And I began to feel, I could feel the presence of the 18 and 19 year old boys who had fought in that battle. And I began to see, it was a very, it was a battle in a very heavy forest area with um, most people were killed with bayonet combat rather than shots. Mm -hmm. And I began to see the bayonets in front of me and I began to feel the, the fear and the horror and the, the, the feelings of these kids. And at first I thought, wow, this is really cool. Cause you know, I'm, I'm 11 years old and getting my first clear sentence and thinking, wow, this is really cool. And my sister who was seven at the time today will still describe it. And she said she could watch, she can remember me. I began to separate further and further from my family because my family would move on to read the next thing. And I was like standing there letting all of this presence flood into me. And my sister said I was getting paler and paler as I, uh, as I was processing all of this into me. And then I, I got ahead of them and I walked up and I, I th- I'm quite sure that I saw um, clairvoyantly two people. And I went running back to my family and they were laughing at me. Now oh, what scared you? And um, we went into this cabin that was in the middle of nowhere and it was a gift shop and there were people dressed in period costumes. And so again, they said to me, I'll oh, see you were just imagining. Um, but later when I went to Arthur Finley, as we talked about Arthur Finley College and we were talking about why do I um, seem to, uh, at that time I moved much easier into trance than into active mediumship. And an instructor there said to me, did you have something happen to you when you were pre-adolescent that was really traumatic related to mediumship? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and he said, because um, that triggered something in you to shut this down, and we have to heal that that overwhelming fear of letting it in in order for you to open uh that part of your of your um, of your site, I still am a much more um, uh, mediums get their their information in many different ways. I'm still a much more clairsentient person. Also, get what they call claircognizance, where I just know it. But often, I very much feel things, even that's when what I sentient means feeling. Yes, mm-hmm. Whereas clairvoyant and is seeing. Seeing, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people think that all mediums see, and it's, I use the term see now when I talk to people, but I see 
I see with my hands, I see with my body, I see with, yeah, it's through senses rather than necessarily through my eyes, although I do increasingly get um, both little movies that play in my head as well as um, pictures of people that come in front of me, but, um, but mostly how I experience uh, the contact with people who with spirits that are, are just not in physical body any longer is through um, this more, this clear sentience and, and, um, and just a knowing that something's there or knowing the other one that is um, knowing I meet people who are grieving or who are struggling with things that, as we mentioned, I've had people since I was a kid, people would come to me with their stories, things happening at home, things happening at school, needing psychological support or or something just struggling with their own thoughts and I always always a big storyteller always somehow pulled a story out of myself that would then resonate with them in a way that helped them deal with that situation and Mm -hmm. I I believe that that as well is was always my um my contact my ability to hear um spirit world that works with me um sort of help me choose know what was wrong and help me choose the story or or the the words that i gave to that person um and so it's uh yeah i don't well so let me say this so then there was a period in my 20s and even in my 30s where i if i was very close to someone i would have prophetic dreams but other than that I really and this sort of ability to sort of tell the story somebody needed to hear at that time but I really shut down thinking that I could do anything else and I really actually shut down my my willingness to to um, process the information that was coming to me um, even though I would watch mediums on TV and think wow that's really cool. I really would love to be able to help people heal that way. Um, and then about 2009, which is, a, is actually when my dog came into my life, um, I start, started having a series of circumstances. I met a woman at a party who had just gotten back from Arthur Finley College who was talking about what she did as a medium. And um, I started... Gigi, just to interrupt you a oh. second. There's many people listening right now who haven't a clue yep. what Arthur Finley College is. Sure. Can you just just a brief what it is? Yeah. So Arthur Finley College is um is a school for for training um or, or developing mediumship and um, spiritual healing. It's a uh, it's in the in the UK, um, north of London. It was the home of a uh, medium in Europe during the 1920s and then to the 1960s. And he donated his, his uh, mansion to the spiritualist national union in order to, um, which is a church in England that um, works with mediumship and in order to create a place where people could professionally train, um, not just to have their experiences, but actually train to understand how to use their, um, there's psychic senses in a sense to open up to and to learn how to give um, evidence to others about mm-hmm. the continuation of life after mm-hmm. death. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. And as someone who went there in May, I can attest it is like no place on earth. And if you have even an inkling of wanting to be a medium or just to see if you have these abilities, well, I believe we all have them to a degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, book a course there they have them all year round and um it's a great place great place. it is okay back to it your story is. sorry mm-hmm. i interrupted you that's okay that's okay so um so we were talking about how i how i feel about life continuing right is that oh we were all over the map oh um, no we're <laughs> yeah <laughs> you you had visited Arthur Finley. Well, yeah, let's just get into this because maybe within, you know, you, you had mentioned that when you talk to people, you just knew what the right stories were to say. So 
why don't you, as you continue with some of the things you've experienced, include for us now, because the name of the show is We Don't Die, any stories that you have through your studies, through your adventures, for the things you learned, why you believe life after death is real. And then we can get into a little bit more about animal communication, the spirit art you do. You can talk about Scrappy, your dog, and... uh and we go from there because there's a lot of us pet lovers as well. So why do you believe, Gigi, that we don't die? Oh, gosh, I think more than anything, it just, for me, it just makes sense that our souls continue. Um, and especially in the, in a, through our love connections. Um, for me, again, as a child, I seem to somehow just instinctively know that. Um, and then as I was re, sort of re, well, I would watch these mediums that were starting to be on TV in the 1980s and I think, oh, see, there it is. You know, you'd watch them tell people things that how could they know that if they exactly. weren't getting that. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and I'd watch how that transpiring would somehow release other people of grief. And that to me was really fascinating because, um, because I thought, oh, somehow we're coming back to an awareness that we already knew that we're always connected. And, um, and then, so as I said, in about 2009, I started sort of really coming back to a fascination with mediumship and remembering and starting to reawaken to my own sort of perceptions that other people may or may not have had. And around that time, a friend of mine had got, uh, a group of us had gone to Brazil with Rotary in 2000. Um, for 40 days and there I met some very nice people and one of the people I met there had then died of um, breast cancer. Be, um, she and I had been very good friends. We'd really connected on the trip there. I had moved back to Brazil for a while um, and while she was dying um, we would converse a lot about our own spiritual beliefs and life, uh, etc. And I have, she was a, an artist, and so I had some of her paintings. Um, and I had a lot of regrets. I was not able to get back to Brazil before she died. I felt like I didn't um, call her often enough. When I got the email from her daughter the one day that told me that she'd transitioned, I just was in this period of self-recrimination and but at the same time this very strong I actually left a job that I was not enjoying to find another job and really start seeking it was all part of this like starting to seek who am I really and what do I really want to be doing and um and then I started to sense her sometimes sometimes I'd be in my house looking at the painting and I could feel you know how like when you're at a party and somebody walks in the room when you have your back to them, but you know, oh, so-and-so just arrived at the party. Yes. Um, that's, I could feel her there. And I think, oh, that just is a memory. I'm just really missing her. But then sometimes I'd say, oh, hi, how are you? Just to let it exist. And then um, then somebody that who had traveled to Brazil with me had at a fir- right before her 48th birthday suddenly went into the hospital with um with abdominal pains which ended up being a a, a stone caught between her gallbladder and her pancreas and Ouch. in the in the in the course in the 24 hours from when she presented at her emergency room to um 24 hours later she, she her kidneys failed her pancreas failed she went into a coma and it was, you know, it was pretty frightening. She she was she actually lived. She she but she was in the hospital for several months, and she didn't have health insurance. And there were a lot of you know questioning: are are they not doing things for her that they could be? Right. She, her pancreas started necrotizing. So I went to visit her in the hospital, and she was very close to death. Is how I felt. I came home in that kind of grief of that you have, that you start grieving before someone passes. Anticipatory grief, I was told, mm-hmm. when my dad was and, dying. Yep. 
I went home and I just cried for her and I cried for the circumstance of her being there. And I felt my friend from Brazil who was now in spirit step right up next to me in the hallway. Hmm. And I said to her, I thought she was there to help my other friend cross. And I said, oh, you are here. And thank you. Can you go to her, help her? Um, what was interesting was I was so sure that she was, you know, I, I felt very sure she was there. I felt very sure that she had come for my friend Kathy, but I thought she had come to help greet her and take her over. The next day, a doctor who had never seen my friend Kathy before came in, saw her, said, we're taking her into surgery right now. And within days, she was getting better. And um, she got out of the hospital with some rehab after having been in the hospital for two and a half months. Wow. And then I met, as I said, I had gone to this party around that time. I met this woman who had just gotten back from Arthur Finley College who was talking to me at the party. And she had said some things to me at the party that then made me want to call her and get my first mediumship reading. And um, during the reading, I said to her, you know, I've been sensing this friend around me lately. And immediately, that's all I said, immediately my, strep my friend stepped forward for her. And she gave me such accurate um descriptions down to how she laughed and what we talked about and how and that she was an artist who painted these big paintings etc um that i knew she had my friend Ines who who from brazil and she um she said to me she didn't know about my friend in the hospital and she said to me you know Ines is saying you know i brought that surgeon to her and i thought oh, it explains all the miracles that happened. Yes. That <laughs> and, um, and it was interesting because in that conversation, at the end of the conversation, the woman who was doing the readings for me said, you know, you are a medium, don't you? You can do this yourself. And I said, it was like, um, it was like somebody pulled up the shade on a window. And I said, you know, as a kid, I knew that. I always hoped that was true. Um, and it was, I would say, well, first of all, if you've never had a mediumship reading, I have to say that first reading where she brought through my friend and could, could give me that kind of evidence, I was on like a two-week high of like, I had to go talk to everybody. I wasn't so, like, sort of like when you're first in love, you know? I had to go tell everybody. Oh, it's, about it's this big. wonderful miracle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, and, Gigi, some people don't have great first readings. So, no, and I know. And yeah. even, even, even mediums sometimes, you know, have been doing it for lots of years. They sometimes, um, just don't make the right connection or, you know, whatever. There's a lot of readings that aren't those miraculous ones. And yet, I think if we're willing to, if we're willing to be open, there's always, even in some of the most failed readings, unless you absolutely don't connect at all, I think that there's always one or two pieces of evidence that if you let yourself be open to it, you think, well, how else? Could that have gotten there right, right. if that soul hadn't told somebody? And so that for me is what I tell people. You know, me, I'm still, I, I a lot of times am still um, practicing and developing. I think all mediums do all their whole lives. Um, and so certainly there are times where you go and you think, oh, what did I do? Why can I do better? But I do think that we, if we look at every time that connection comes in any way, shape, or form that gives you anything that resonates with you as, as a potential piece of evidence that really says, how did they know that? I think that begins to really open our, our minds to the thing, to let go of the things we've been programmed to tell us are just imagination. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's Gigi, coming to me? Uh -huh, Gigi, I was on your website last night, and for all the correspondence we've done, uh -huh. I had no idea that you you drew pictures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that? Cause there, sure. Because at some point, because I know you draw pictures of spirit guides and uh -huh. uh, both animal and human, but yeah. I also saw some pictures of people, 
as they lived in a photograph and you're drawing. How did that start? Because basically you're drawing a picture of somebody you see in your mind's eye that's coming through. And I'm not a trained artist. Um, I always liked art. I had a lot of artists in my family, but I always defined myself as not an artist. And so I didn't, other than, you know, classes you take in elementary school and middle school, I really mm-hmm. never pursued it. Um, and it actually goes back to my, my very first visit to Arthur Finley College. Um, one of the instructors that was there that week was a spirit artist, and I had never heard of such a thing. Um, and when they were doing the demonstration readings to the gallery of people there, she um, one person was doing the reading, and she would draw whoever they were connected to. And she did it two different ways. One, she would be actually very conscious and drawing with one hand in a very traditional artist way. Mm-hmm. Um, the others, she would put a pencil in each hand and she'd go into trance so her eyes were closed and she would draw very rapidly um with both portrait. hands yes with both hands with Just her eyes wild. closed yeah. a portrait yeah and i thought at the time wow that is so cool i would love to be able to do that but i, I how many years of of art classes would i have to take to yes. do that uh-huh. So it was, for me, I always say this was a lesson in, in prayer, put out prayer to the universe and then let it go because I put it out there just in that thought without even thinking that's what I was doing. And I let it, I forgot I even did that. Two years later, so about a, a year and a half ago when I was living in California, I had a very intense meditation experience where I closed my eyes meditating in a garden. And what I saw as I closed my eyes was the face of a tiger, eye to eye, nose to nose with me. And and I see, I'm, a, I'm somebody who sees a lot. I get my mediumship in color, intense color. Uh, I always thought that everybody, when they close their eyes to go to sleep at night, saw these intense color shows. I've recently learned that's not that's true. That's not true. <laughs> but I thought it was. Yeah. And so, um, so I saw this, this like tiger with these gorgeous turquoise blue eyes, like face to face with me. And I was compelled to want to put it on paper and mm-hmm. show people what I see when I close my eyes. So I, I, I was, um, not employed at the time. I was living at a friend's house. I thought, now how do I do that? And I happened to buy a $1 scratch ticket, which gave me $35. And I went and I bought $35 worth of art supplies. Cool. And I sat and I thought about it and I thought, I can't draw it. How do I draw that? And then one morning I honored a voice in my head that said, go to the park and take your art supplies with you. And that day I drew my first two drawings of what I call power animals. I drew a tiger, a lion, Actually, three, a tiger, a lion, and a wolf, just in a matter of minutes. This very dramatic, um, abstract, colorful style, but basically a face with eyes. Mm -hmm. And I posted them on Facebook, and I immediately had friends from around the world who were medium saying, Gigi, oh, my God. You know, where are the, can you feel the healing energy coming off of those? Can you feel the energy? And I said, yeah. I said, it's interesting because that. It's not, I said, it's an interesting thing because I wanted to do spirit art and I believe that's what I'm doing because I'm actually getting this message about an animal, an energy that was working with someone or appeals to someone, but it's not how I thought I'd see it. That's not what I thought I'd do, but hey, it's cool. I'll mm-hmm. do that. Yep. And I did that for a week. And one day I was driving home from taking someone somewhere, I don't remember, and I suddenly saw in my like I said, this clairvoyance where you see like a little movie play in your head, I suddenly saw a cat run through. And I thought, huh, that's interesting because I don't have cats. And then the cat came through a couple more times. And I thought, well, I got to pull over to the side of the road. And I got out my notebook and I wrote, I I decided, well, I'm going to do this just like a reading. And so I started talking to the cat spirit and I wrote down a bunch of information they gave that I was getting about names and places and what did the cat look like. And I did a quick sketch and then I went in the house and I sat down and I did my meditation before drawing and I drew a cat, um, a tab, a gray cat, tabby cat with uh, three very distinctive different paws. And I, I knew of someone in England who actually is a, she's, she specializes in doing animal readings. She's an animal communicator and she does animal Reiki. And I knew she had had a cat crossover recently. And I said, I wrote to her and I said, you know, I think I got your cat. 
And I started telling her all the information and I sent her this picture. And she said, well, we've had hundreds of cats in our life. And um, the tabby cat wasn't the one that just crossed, but we had one. And she said, but let me go to my daughter who really took care of them. She found out that one of the names I gave her was her daughter's online gaming name, <laughs> which That's was funny. not was she didn't know what it was but and i just it was name was like mishi and i said i got this name mishi i thought it was the cat's name and it was actually her daughter's online gaming name so it was one of those confirmation pieces mm -hmm. and she said you know the coloration of those three paws are actually the three different cats that just crossed so what i had was a picture blending and i drew the last toy they made of her so i thought okay cool now i'm still on 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 animals that's cool and then, then a week later, I drew one of my spirit guides in five minutes. And then after that, I, I drew a person. Mm -hmm. And I thought, is this real or not? But um, there's online classes that I take uh, where you do practice sessions. And I thought, well, I'm going to put it out there. And a lady in the Netherlands said, that's my friend, and I'm going to send you a picture. She doesn't have the bandana on that I had drawn, but I do. And then from there, it's kind of evolved. Um so that's that's one of the the ways that my that's one of the ways I see. Um, I actually don't know what I'm drawing when I'm drawing. I can feel it, and I can hear like almost as if I'm the person drawing a self portrait. I can go, no, that's not my nose. Change my nose. Do this. But I actually don't know what they look like until I've drawn them. And then that's even weird. sometimes I have to. I, sometimes what's really weird is I hold the. If I hold the, like I'm not quite done with the drawing, something I can't quite get, I hold up the drawing to the mirror, and then I hear what to correct, and I correct it. Um, so it's it's a fascinating, I love it. For me, it's, um, I, I debate at times taking uh, some art classes now, but I love the fact that I can say to people, Look, I learned how to do this shading. I learned how to do this color. Look at the the styles are completely different depending on who I connect with. It doesn't look like the same artist did the drawing. Um, and so I love that. And then, as we've mentioned a little bit before, uh, since my dog has crossed, he actually brings me... Um, I've, I've done a lot more drawings of pets recently um, that... At first, I thought he was just bringing me, like, here's my new playmates on the other side. Let me show you. But they all seem to have connected. It, eventually, I've done a reading with someone or a practice session with someone, and I've said, hey, you know, wait a minute. I had this drawing I have to ask you about. And it's, it's he's not just bringing me um, his playmates in, in the spirit world, but he actually is bringing me people's pets that I'm about to do readings for. So it's an interesting. That's amazing. And, and then let me just ask you, if – someone has lost a pet or lost a loved one, do you offer as a medium that you'll do a reading on them and then a drawing? Um, I don't know so, how that goes. That, that yeah, world. so for me, um, and this is partially because of the way that I was trained in sort of spiritualist traditions, I usually don't preset who I'm trying, uh, who I can do a reading for or who or, or of or um, what, who I'm drawing other than asking the spirit world to give me the, the soul that most wants to talk to that person at that time and that they most need to hear from. Mm, okay. Yeah. So um, now that doesn't mean that spirit world doesn't know that they absolutely need that person. And, and I certainly, um, I would try if somebody really says, you know, I have a pet and I don't, would not want a lot of information. Um, I could certainly sit and, uh, do the, con see if I can do the connection. If I got the connection, I would do the reading. If I, if I didn't get the connection, I would just say, it doesn't mean for me, if a medium doesn't connect to who you want to hear from, or who you really want to hear from. Um, there can be a number of reasons. It doesn't mean that that person or, or animal can't come through or won't come through or it, that, you know, whatever conclusions people have. Um, sometimes each, each of us, I believe each of us has our own energy and vibration. And sometimes um, we don't vibrate at the right level to connect well with that 
particular soul. So we as a person, um, it, it, that person would need to come through to a different medium in order to come through. And then sometimes we in our grief or in our attachment to saying, I really want to hear from this person. That sometimes I believe what we do is we create an energy in ourselves that actually becomes like a resistor on the electric circuit um, that that actually blocks the communication. So often my experience is, especially people who've never gone to a medium before, often what happens is your initial reading will be somebody you didn't think of at all coming through, but somebody you're like, oh, yeah, that's my grandma or something. Mm -hmm. And it's after that, after you relax this expectation of I really need to hear from so and so that that when you get into that space of relaxing that the other soul that you really want to connect to comes through yeah is it has been my experience and so for me um and the other thing for me is i have to say as a child i was a very much perfect child syndrome so um when someone comes to me and says oh i really want to talk to so and so it almost creates a block for me because um because it triggers my inner perfect child who says, what if you don't get it right? Oh, <laughs> and, and we so, all have that. I mean, I trained yeah. at the Arthur Finley College <laughs> and people have heard me say this. I have not had the courage yet to really practice because I don't want to be wrong. You know, people are yeah. grieving and I want to give them something. And it's like, it's not about Sandra. It's not about Gigi. It's really about exactly. blessing what we get. So yeah. Gigi, you're awesome. And I want to move now because there's yeah. a lot of people including myself, that love animals. We love our pets. And um, I want to know about Scrappy. I want to know about Scrappy's impact on you and and maybe some animal communication. And um, and even we were talking a little bit about death midwife. What the heck is that? And yeah. just, just if you would yeah, just spend some time because I know um, Scrappy so, has been very special to you. And yeah. uh, tell us about Scrappy. Scrappy is... Was Scrappy and is in the was, spirit world a dog? Yes, he's my my. Um, he was a Brazilian terrier, sort of like a Jack Russell, um, and he was with me for eleven years. Um, and I was his third owner, so he he had three owners in the first three years of his life, um, and then lived to be fourteen, so a, a good life uh, for for length. Uh, as a child, I always loved animals, but we didn't have a lot of pets, and we always defined my younger brother as Dr. Doolittle, so again, I didn't think of myself as a potential uh, really deep connection with animals, but um, in a, about 2006, 2006, I started really, um, oh, 2005, I started really wanting to have a dog. My brother had moved into animal services. Everybody was starting to adopt dogs from the shelter. And I was living across the country, not finding what I wanted. I had this very strange situation where I was leaving a job to go to a new job. And the person I was training came in for two weeks of training before I left. And we were talking about dogs. And she said, oh, too bad. I, I gave my, I had this other dog I had to give away. And too bad. Um, he's not around anymore because he'd have been perfect for you. She said, but I always told these people if they ever were going to give him away, they, they should call me first. And then a week later she called me and she said, Hey, you know what? Those people, they don't want their dog anymore. And that was how I got Scrappy. Sweet. And um, Scrappy for me, I think all dogs come to help us open our hearts and really understand unconditional love. He gave me, I was uh, living alone and I, um, had had uh you know i was dealing i was in my 30s and i was dealing with a lot of sort of letting go of i had always dreamed i'd get married and have children and whatever and it didn't seem like that was happening and then came scrappy to my life and um he, he had a lot of quirks he had a lot of separation anxiety because of course he'd been given away three times he was very smart um, so if he saw you packing, he was sure he was going somewhere. If he, if you drove, drove up to a house that he'd never been to before, he'd start crying. That's heartbreaking. Um, yeah, it was hard, but he learned, we got to be quite close. Um, 
And then we would run into his old owner. And that was, again, giving, giving new insights because he recognized them instantly. They were his original family. Sure. And, it, and at first he wanted to go home with them, but he didn't want to go home with them if I wasn't coming too. And um, so it was very nice that we got to be friends and we could have this interaction. But I said to people, look, he didn't see them for three years and he knew instantly who they were. Started to challenge people who said, oh, you know, dogs don't think like people. They don't feel the same way as people. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, so very anyway, smart. Uh, pets he, are um, very smart. Yes. And, and he was always, people always would look at him and they'd say, oh, he's quite a character. And um, I wrote a blog post where he's, talking about that and and he um he was i say he was i think a lot of animals are anyways they're much more aware like uh, cats staring off into space sometimes are staring at your loved one in the spirit world that's standing in the room and you're just not aware of it um scrappy had this sensitive he was super protective of me so he would not allow men to walk behind me at night and without barking at them and scaring them to death. And I had a few men uh, comment on him being that big protector. But um, as I started doing meditation and started working on my mediumship, he started barking. He scared me a couple times because he would go into full attack mode, <laughs> barking at things when I'm meditating in a dark room. And I realized that he was seeing things he hadn't seen before and he was... Um, he was protecting me as he got accustomed to the, oh, okay, I know who that is now. He would then uh, meditate with me. Um, so anyways, we became quite <laughs> close. Yeah, he's funny. He I'm was just funny. laughing at, at, you're just imagining, you know, you're going yeah. into a meditation and you're experiencing this and the dog's barking, seeing it also. And he jumps up in full attack mode. Oh my gosh. Crashed. And now, <laughs> now you're up. telling me he, he meditated with you. He meditated with me, and then he meditated with me when one one night when we were doing group uh, a group meditation on uh, uh, past life regression experiment, and um, and I had to take him down the hall because he was bothering everybody else. So I took him down the hall, and I meditated not right with the group, and that was my first successful meditation where I sort of got this like past life regression, and I learned that he had been with me in that past life. Nice. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So then um, right around that time, I, I was looking at doing some of my own self-healing, as we mentioned earlier, and I was looking for alternative things because I felt like uh, Western world medicine wasn't quite doing it for me. And I met this woman I invited over for dinner who was just starting her naturopathic uh, uh, practice. And she came and she was one of those people the whole night she was like, gosh, he's an interesting dog. And he was acting with her like he knew her. And he usually was very standoffish to other people at first. He liked people, but he would always be clingy to me. And he was very clingy to her and looking at me like, ha, ha, ha. And um, towards the end of the night, he moved from her to me. And she later told me, she didn't want to tell me at the time because she thought, oh, I was going to think she was crazy. But um, she later told me that that night, what, she, what he was actually figuring out how to talk to her. And as she was leaving that night, he said to her, he moved his, he like connected our energy fields together. And he said to her, lady, you're not leaving until you figure out how to heal my owner. And um, so that was my first understanding that he could communicate. And I thought, well, how come he communicated with her and not with me? Well, I started to learn that I um, just wasn't tuning in or I wasn't allowing myself to believe he, uh, you know how dogs, they like, they want to treat and they're kind of giving you little signals and you mm -hmm. and you think well yeah well I can just reason that out or it's just imagination but he used to do this thing that I called the Jedi the Jedi mind game, stare you know like where where <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi puts the thought in your head you sure. will give me the treat you know yep, yep. and he, you could watch him do it and, and he would get more and more intense as he was trying to put that thought in you and one day uh, again, after I had first gone to Arthur Finley College, I said to him, I tuned in, and I heard what he was saying, and I asked, I said to him, are you telling me this? And he did a happy dance. It was so cute. <laughs> he did this happy dance, and then he did the stare again. And then I said to him, you're telling me this? And then he did the happy dance. So I started opening up to, gee, maybe we are communicating, and maybe it's the same as between people and people. Um, so anyways, let's, 
move a little forward. He, um, for me, the biggest thing is that in the last two years, I, I had a lot of move, moving, a lot of disruption in my life. And during that time frame, he and I were twice have to be separated once where he was in a kennel for, for 30 days, once when he actually had to be rehomed for, uh, eight months. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the heartbreaking for me, but what was interesting, and I think heartbreaking for him as well, but what was interesting was during that time, we got a lot of lessons. I would dream about him at night, and I would often wake up with the sensation of him laying in bed next to me. Um, and then when I would come fully awake, I'd go, oh, he's not there. But I knew, I accepted that somehow during sleep time, our souls were coming together. And I knew my parents uh, this was my first pet, so I had not yet experienced a pet crossing, but I knew my parents had, and I knew my parents had thought they were imagining their dog trying to get up in bed with them at night or hearing him walk through the house in the weeks following his yes. crossing. And I used to say to them, no, that's not your imagination. As I started to say earlier, one of my favorite quotes from a medium named John Holland is, he says he hates when people say, oh, it's just your imagination. Imagination is your key to the portal that connects you to the spirit world. Ooh, so I like that. Imagination is your key to the portal that connects you with the spirit world. Is that what you said? Yeah. That's a good so, one. Imagination is actually what gets you there because they're communicating in these snippets. And you have to be able to take that. And get that to like, oh, yeah, that was so-and-so. or And so um, so I used to tell my parents, it's not your imagination. That's, that's your dog. He's there with you. You know, let yourself accept that. It'll feel better. And so when Scrappy and I were, he was alive, but we were separated. We, I was having that same experience. And I understood, I started to begin to really understand the depth of his connection with me. And there I was in the middle of learning my spirit drawing, and I one day drew him. Didn't know I was drawing him until I got the drawing done. I was like, oh, my God, that's scrappy. And I thought, did he die? Because he was now with this other family. Mm -hmm. And then two days later, I woke up from a dream, and I said oh, out loud to him, I said, oh, buddy, I'm getting you back. I had no idea how. About a month later, um, no, maybe a couple of weeks later, uh, I had a cousin call and ask me if I wanted to move in with her and, and in, would I ever think of getting a dog again. And I immediately called the people that I'd been putting off calling that had him to ask how he was doing because I had been putting that off because I didn't want to know that he had crossed into the spirit world because that's what I thought the drawing was. And they said, oh, I, we actually were just about to put him up for adoption. And I said, can I have, can you hold him for a month? Because I can come and get him back. It was the most exciting thing for me. Um, when I got him back, he had changed dramatically in that year, aged a lot, gotten very thin. He was very depressed. Um, but in a very brief number of hours after we drove away and we drove up to the first gas station near where I used to live, he suddenly perked up like he remembered that's where we were. And it He's was home. like, yeah, yeah, he switched back in. And then, you know, he had a few more, uh, about three months later, that stuff in California was obviously not the final place because I suddenly was packing him back into the car and we drove from California to my parents' house in Florida in a matter of three and a half days. And that's, um, and then, as we were going there, I knew my parents are aging and, and um, I was getting a lot of spirit communication that I was not to take on too much responsibility there. I was supposed to assign somebody to help my mom. So I told Scrappy it was his duty because um, I knew she missed her dog. And uh, so we get to, to we get to Florida in December and he was in heaven because he'd been there before lots of times, but it had been quite a few years. In fact, he spent the first couple of days looking around the house for their dog who had crossed, mm -hmm. um, who was his buddy. And then um, I started having dreams. I had dreams that he was, um, I had dreams that he had cancer tumors and I thought uh, that I was supposed to be trying to heal him and I was very wrapped up in like I'm not learning how to do this and he's getting sicker here in Florida he began to have some coughing and some other things um there's a uh, most of the fleas in this area are very resistant to the topical medicine so you have to give them that much harsher 
pill right. medicine yeah. and that in and a, and a dog who had been very sensitive um he was grain free he had he had reflected to me i forgot to mention that, earlier he had reflected to me all of my health issues so he had seasonal allergies when i had seasonal allergies he was allergic to or intolerant of wheat and corn i took it out of his diet way before i took it out of mine later i realized oh that was my issue um and i do think our pets often do that they show us our issues that we aren't paying attention to but interesting never never thought of that yeah if you read um there's a woman named Danielle McKinnon who wrote a book on soul contracts with your pets and um she talks about that they, that often our pets mirror to us so whether it's personality or or physical conditions they mirror to us what we need to focus on um but he he began to get sick here and I would do cuz I had it in my head that I that I was supposed to heal him that yes he was getting older but you know first i was supposed to heal him and then he would die um i would ignore some of the signs that were coming and um or i would do things to and he'd get a little better in in june he crossed um in june he got suddenly very ill with symptoms of congestive heart failure a lot of dogs die of congestive heart failure, and I have my theories on that as well. But he, um, I mean, it was so sudden, and it was so sick. And I was in a fairly new job, and I, I, you know, I wanted to stay home with him. But thank God he could at least stay home with my parents. Um, and there were some things that happened that allowed me to come home early. Some days I was able to spend some more time with him. And I struggled with, is he... Do I really know? Am I really hearing him telling me and showing me that he's dying? Or is he have something that if I just took him to the right vet, if I just got the right medicine, mm -hmm. he'd be miraculous okay. healing. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and, and I'd say to people, it's not about, sometimes I know that's about people not being able to let go. And I used to say to people, no, it's not about not letting to let go. I just want to know that I, that I didn't let him down in something that was so easy to fix. And, um, but as I began to get closer to making an appointment, I made an appointment to go take him somewhere, but I knew my inner voices were telling me long and hard that this was it. Um, and that we needed to start letting go. And I started, I told my parents, I said, you know, we need to tell him, we need to tell him that it's okay. We'll be okay if he goes because I felt like we were holding him somehow in this physical suffering in his body because he was such a take or care take care of me protect me um, person and now my parents as well that I felt like if we were saying oh no but we don't want to lose another dog um, that that somehow we were holding him. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. This so, can be very so, similar to people, too. Gigi, just exactly. being mm -hmm. mindful of time, we mm -hmm. only have about five minutes left. Okay, so yes. Just, um, yeah, I want to hear, because I know a lot yeah. of so let me tell you quickly, where you're going applies is, to people right now. Okay, I was, go ahead. Um, yeah, he, so let me tell you that he did show me, he, he did show me that week that um, I got visions and talking in my head that he didn't want to go, he didn't want to go to the vet and be put down. Although I, I would tell people that that is perfectly fine as well. That is a way that, that some pets know that that's, that helps them cross. I was given the blessing of being shown that he wanted to, to lay in the yard and uh, with me and miraculously the weather worked out um and that morning he showed me again matthew called from england and gave us a blessing and then um i took him outside and he laid out there and he um and his last moments he he lifted his head to look at a, a plane flying over and then he put his paws on my legs and he asked me to pick him up and as I picked him up he I could tell he was having more difficulties breathing so I said to him you know what buddy we're going to do yoga breaths remember yoga breaths from when we used to meditate oh, and I had him geez. and I had him breathe in with me and I said come on bud here we go breathe in and breathe out and he tremored a little and I sat there and I was in this space of total focus on him and our love connection. He was, I was holding him like a baby across my chest. And I said, okay, buddy, 
this time one last time all the way out. And I breathed in and I breathed out this very long breath and there was this sudden sense of peace, just a tremendous peace and I'm rocking him in my arms and I was thinking, oh, we should sit here in the shade and, you know, and then I realized I heard I heard him. He said, I'm not here. I, sh- look at me. I'm not there anymore. And Aww. I said, and um, this was the day. This, so I went in and I told my parents and I took him inside and I did my things to prepare him and um, and to sort of just process everything. And I was so sure, you know, when he was dying that day, he was holding on so hard. And I said to him, I kept remember, reminding him, look, buddy, you know, we're connected. Here's the lessons we had from the last year. I kept calling him my valiant warrior. And I kept saying, just, you can go now. It's okay. Cause we're still connected. Um, so the day, the day after he died was the Orlando shootings, oh, wow. um, yeah. which interrupted my grief for a while. But um, I had people later from around the world tell me that they saw, I actually believe he crossed for a purpose because they actually saw him, other people saw him actually greeting the souls from the shooting in Orlando and helping to pull them to focus on where they needed to go. Oh, to- you got um, me with tears in my eyes. Right oh, I, I, it's all right. Yeah. I know what it's like to lose a, a little and he, um, critter that I love so much. Yeah, so here's what I want to say. He he came to me three days later. He, he wasn't present right away, and I was very shocked by that. Um, and I, I was told, I was reminded of teaching that I had that sometimes spirit, when they first cross, need to go to sort of like healing centers and actually heal and rest before they are in their spirit world life. Good to know for those who... And when he came yeah. back, he said to me, you shouldn't be sad. You just birthed me into my new life. And he told me that's what this death midwife thing that that some people do nowadays and had come up for me as a theme as something I should look into. He told me I was born to come in and help people be birthed into their new life in the spirit world. And that he'd help me learn how to do that. Yeah. Um, I actually believe that there are people increasingly doing that with, with, with hospice work, but I actually believe that my work will be more with helping people who have pets and who are trying to determine if they, is their pet sick? Is their pet telling them they're dying? What do they need to do? I think that um, my work will eventually be much more, it will work with people as well, but it'll actually be much more with that because my, since he's died, um, he comes to me, as I said, he brings pets to me to draw. Um, he has done some fr- tremendous uh, lessons in how to look for for our loved ones giving us reminders he's here. Um, one day I t- was taking a picture of the sunset um, at the beach here, which I love to do, and the clouds formed his face so dramatically that when I put his picture on Facebook and said, hey, here, look at Scrappy was here, everybody that saw it that knew him or had seen his picture said, oh, my God, I can see him. And a couple of them said to me, look at the other, he brought other dogs, and there are four other dogs. And the and- clouds, I'll have to look at that picture. <laughs> Um, still have he it up. Has, he's done a few other things. So let's let's wrap up. But uh, what I say to people is understand if you're grieving for a pet and you think you're imagining that pet in your house, that's your pet. Our pets are as connected to us, if not more connected to us than our other loved ones in the spirit world. They will be there when we cross, but they are here with us continuously they will find ways to find you signs um sometimes they will actually use other animals sometimes they'll leave you feathers and things just like loved ones do but they <laughs> scrappy also comes to me we were sort of soulmates and he comes to me he plays the music of the sleeping beauty waltz in my head and i i feel myself dancing in the arms of a partner in a waltz like it like in a movie and that's um the first time he came to me that way i wasn't quite sure what it was and all of a sudden i knew it was him um so he's giving me lessons from the other side now that continue to show me um that we ha- are connected. He comes uh, one t- the first time I did trance healing after he crossed, 
he said he came to me and while I was in meditation and he said I get to show you come on come with me I get to show you what my life is like now and he took me to the fields that he was playing with all the other dogs while I was allowing healing energy to channel through me to the person I was doing healing on and um, when when that healing session was done he said okay they said you've got to go back now and then I got to go I got to come out of my my trance meditation knowing um, it, that we had that connection and that we would continue to work together on healing other people. Gee, so. that's so special. I remember when my kitty Millie, when we put her to sleep, I mean, it was just such a battle with, is it the right thing to do? Is she in pain? And to be able to talk to somebody and to, who can tap into that, that's beautiful. And um it's it's a real gift. So thank you for that. And also what's coming to mind is that we didn't talk much on this, but just for all of us who have had a pet to really, and especially dogs, I think they're a little different than cats, but just to feel that unconditional love and to imagine, you know, they're happy to see you no matter how long you've been gone or, uh, you know, I don't want to say if you forgot to feed them, whatever it is, it's like, it's just complete unconditional love. So uh, yes. If you're, and it, do we have maybe just a one? Yes. One or so? You betcha. So he, the very first time he came to me after he crossed over, he came in a dream right before I was waking up in the morning. And I was in the middle of a dream where I was doing something else. And you know how your pet sometimes like interrupts when you're reading the newspaper or something. Says, "Hey, pay attention to me." Yes. That's what he did. He interrupted, and in the dream, I did just like we do in our life. Like, <laughs> why'd you stop? I'm what? would you stop? Get out of my way because I'm doing this. And then I woke up and I thought, oh, wait. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And I, then I realized my first lesson from him was, you know, for the last few months, did it really matter if mom was feeding him something he wasn't supposed to get fed? Did it really matter if he peed in the house because he was now getting old enough and he, he couldn't hold it anymore? Did you... You know, could you have taken five more minutes to spend some time with him just having fun and loving? And I thought, wow, that was now that he's gone and I miss him. And his first lesson to me was to come in a dream where I had that same little sort of annoyance we have. And I said, what a wonderful lesson for us that not only does life continue, but I also have aging parents. And, and the same message comes, you know, do do I need to be irritated? Do I need, because we're trying to merge our lives again, or do I just learn how to totally unconditionally express my love in the time, the very short time that we have together in the physical world? I think that's the answer right there. Mm -hmm. Love, love, love. Gigi, thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Wow. And thank you to your audience. <laughs> yeah, definitely thank you to the audience. You who's listening right now, I hope we've touched a place in your heart. I, I can't help but think of when I adopted my kitty, Millie. I mean, I hated cats, and this little cat snuck into my house and ended up sneaking into my heart, and I had her for 11 years. And, you know, you know the expression, better to have loved and lost than never to have yes. loved at all. I had no idea that I could love so deeply. And it was for a cat, but I, man, I loved her. And so anybody toying with getting a pet or adopting, um, you know, yeah, I know it's hard when we lose someone, but the, th the thing is, is that love that we feel and what we can learn from them. And like Gigi says, you know, we don't die. Our pets don't die. You know, they can hear you now and you can come. If you're open, you can communicate with them now. And even when they cross over, they're still there teaching lessons. So uh, one thing I just want to say at the end, when I wrote this down because you said it so brilliantly. Imagination is your key to the portal that lets you connect to the spirit world. Uh, so many times we think what's in our imagination is just nothing. And I tell you from all the things that I've done, if you can start just imagining things, um, whatever that may be, and just really practice your imagination, you know, watch all of a sudden, you're going to be getting messages you haven't had before, you're going to be having dreams. And that definitely uh, is is the way through. So um, Gigi Trebid Tusky, I'm always afraid I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> How do we get in touch with you? Well, so I well. have the um, Indigo Soulways. Um, 
website and also um, a Facebook page that's also um, Indigo Soulways. And um, and then I also have a, 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 both a blog on that Indigo Web uh, Soulways and on my Facebook page that's related just to stories or lessons from Scrappy. And I encourage people... If you either are touched by his story or if you have stories of your own about your pets who have crossed, please feel free to share them there. Uh, um, it seems that that Scrappy's role, um, p- other people are from around the world who were touched by his initial story or who had met him asked me to start the Facebook page for him. It's called Scrappy Guru. Um, <laughs> and it's... It's right now mostly stories um, that I tell through his voice, but I really encourage people if you wish to share them, um, it's a forum to get it out to other people and, and it helps you. I think the more I tell the stories of Scrappy, the more I pull him closer in the spirit world to me and our connection becomes even stronger so i encourage you if you have those to please feel free to share them with us or share them on your pages and let people know because it allows other people um i would say it's the it's a hand reaching out of the darkness into the light and it lets people come out of their grief and move back into that space of love knowing that that love continues. Yeah, ultimately, love never dies. They're all around. So thank you, Gigi. Thank you thank to our you. listener. And remember, I oh, not remember, I'm going to tell you right now, going to we don't die radio.com, click on episode 122 and all the links uh, for Gigi's website and for um, her blog and for Scrappy's Facebook page and all that is is right there. Okay, so I do hope you've enjoyed the show. In closing, my name is Sandra Champlain and I've been your host once again on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. Your loved ones haven't died. Your pets haven't died. They're just in that invisible space, you know, where the internet is and GPS signals and television and radio waves. And we can still access them through our imagination. So I want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.